My name is Sayyid Muhammad Sayyid. I'm the National Director of the Islamic Society of North America, special office that we created here in Washington, D.C., which is more involved in interfaith, government relations, public relations here in Washington, D.C. So I was one of the founders of the Islamic Society of North America, and John was at that mm. time a student in Temple University of one of our very beloved leaders, Dr. Ismail al Farooqi. So therefore, all this time, we have worked together very closely for the same mission, that is to identify who speaks for Muslims. So here is the latest book that John has on this very issue. And I, this is such a wonderful feeling that I don't have to introduce him because you came because all of you are his admirers. Uh, Dr. John Esposito is a leading expert on the Muslim world. He is a university professor and a professor of religion and international affairs and Islamic studies at Georgetown University and the founding director of Georgetown's Prince Al Walid bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding in the Walsh School of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Services. So this is the book, and we are very proud, very lucky that we have Dr. John Esposito himself to present the book. Great. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, uh, and uh, it's been a long time uh, for me to get here, but it's a long way from the university to here. It's a good 10, 12 minutes. Um, I want to talk a bit about the book and why it's unique. Uh, and then I'll uh, refer to a couple of things that are unique about it, but I'll, I'll leave a good deal of what we do uh, if, if, to the discussion in terms of an opportunity. Why do I think this is important? What's unique about this book? Um, uh, why do some people uh, praise it? Um, why did the, for example, in addition to people like Archbishop Tutu and Karen Armstrong and uh, former government leaders, uh, why would you have the, um, the man that headed up the CIA, uh, CIA's bin Laden unit, Michael Shura, and some of you have read some of his work, uh, he's very good on these, say that this is the one book that Americans uh, should read or need to read before it's too late. Um, it's because I think post 9-11 we exist increasingly um, in a world in which there are forces uh, pushing for polarization. Uh, you have obviously uh, <clears throat> the terrorist on the one hand uh, and the preachers of hate uh, in the Muslim world uh, and you have the preachers of hate uh, in the Christian world, uh, both uh, religious preachers, uh, the militant uh, Zionist far right, um, as well as many political commentators and pundits, and you know we know many of their names. Although it's very funny when you name those kinds of folks, other people will say, "Well, nobody takes them seriously." You know, it's kind of when when they want to sort of dismiss them. Well, the thing is, then if they're on the radio and television all the time, and if people like O'Reilly have one of the largest followings, you know, uh, on TV, um, they're prominent. But we also have a battle of experts. Uh, if you are your average policymaker, if you're the average citizen, and you want to know what should American foreign policy be like, or what are the uh, root causes of 9-11, and then you have other voices who disagree with them, you know. Uh, so what's a person to, to do? What are they to believe? And they're all talking about what Muslims think. You know, you listen to a lot of discussions, they'll say, well, this is how they view the world. This is the way they think. This is, this is how they regard women. This is how they treat their women, etc. Um, and, you know, what is one to do? And, and here you have the silent majority um, that is sitting there while everybody in the world is talking about them and what they think. <coughs> and who does the media focus on? Well, the natural thing, and this is not, it's the fault of the media, but it's also the nature of the industry. The media is about sales. It's about bottom line. It's about impact. And what sells, as a senior Newsweek uh, editor said, is conflict. Conflict situations and conflictual discourse. I mean, that's what draws people. I mean, think about what I call Shout TV. You know, you don't really have discussions. You have lots of people who are going back and forth. You always have to have going back and forth, even kind of, you know, almost raising their voice at people, being dismissive, etc. 
Well, what's remarkable about this study, and there are many polls of the Muslim world, but what makes this distinctive is this is the most comprehensive, <coughs> most systematic poll of the Muslim world ever done. It's a poll of more than 35 Muslim countries from North Africa to Southeast Asia. It's a poll um, that grids countries so that it's not just urban areas, it's urban areas, rural areas, towns. If I were doing um, a, uh, uh, a PowerPoint presentation, I would show you a map and you would see red dots all over the country. It's a poll that depends on some 50,000 one-on-one interviews. These interviews are done in local languages by local people, so people will be comfortable. Uh, and it's a poll that grids in terms of age differences, in terms of male and female, in terms of socioeconomic status, in terms of literate and illiterate. As a result, by polling standards, it represents the voices of a billion Muslims, okay? Within plus or minus 3% in terms of accuracy. And what does this poll tell us? Well, on a number of things it goes against the conventional wisdom, on other things it it doesn't, you know. By, now remember, con- you should understand conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom is not what some of us may think and then say, well, I always knew that. So, you know, the question is why conventional wisdom, I mean the conventional wisdom, for example, of the Bush administration and its policies and of the kinds of folks I've been just sort of talking about. Let's start with the basic question. Why do they hate us? And the notion that they hate the West because of who we are. Who we are is and then we put our best foot forward. You know, we're a democracy, we believe in human rights, gender equality, etc. And they, and then you just fill in the other side, you know, the opposite, as it were. And that it's an uncritical hatred of the West. Well, there are a few points to be made. One, I'm not sure if we make in the book, but I want to make right here, and that is there's a difference between hatred of America and anti-Americanism. Hatred of America is by people who are terrorists. Okay, that's a small but significant minority. Anti-Americanism is almost a global phenomenon, and it's not just restricted to the Muslim world. As you know, there were polls last year where people were asked, you know, what do you see as the single most biggest threat to global security? And many of them said the United States policy, foreign policy, okay? So we've got to distinguish between that. But, But let's look at the attitude towards the West when we look at the Muslim world. What we see, first of all, is that Muslims clearly distinguish among and between Western countries. And so they put the United States and the UK here, France, Germany, and many other European countries on the other side. And particularly, they distinguish between Bush and Blair and the leadership of other European countries. So clearly, there's a distinction. And that immediately, that distinction tells you that, therefore, the so-called clash or differences are not about culture or religion. They're about policy, the perception of policy, the experience of policy. That's one. Two, where do we see it? When we actually look at statistics, that is, if you compare attitudes towards the U.S. and Canada, it's like night and day. We call Canada America without its foreign policy. And so you will see uh, high unfavorable ratings of the U.S. coming from a Muslim country. Canada will get like a 3% unfavorable rating, this sharp disjuncture. And you also see that uh, in, in other countries when you look at the polls. Many Muslims talk about what they admire about the West. So there are things that they admire about the West. What are they? Our technology, our achievements, our work ethic, our freedoms, our rule of law. Okay? Many of them are all the things that Americans would say we admire about ourselves and think that one should admire. Do they resent many Muslims, uh, many, many things about the West? Yes. And what are the things that they say they resent about the West? They talk about our unilateralism, our arrogance in the conduct of foreign policy. Uh, Many Muslims talk about, in particular, in open-ended questions, when asked what do you resent about the West, open-ended rather than closed questions. Uh, They say uh, the denigration of Islam and Muslims, looking down upon Muslims as if they are uh, uh, different from or beneath uh, other people. If you understand this last set of comments, coming from a whole group of Muslims, it will tell you, that is a broad base of Muslims, it will tell you something about why the reaction to something like the Danish cartoons. If you feel that your religion and you yourself are seen as somehow different or more backwards than other people, if you feel powerless and humiliated, 
then how much more so when somebody starts making fun of you in the media? I mean, no matter what ethnic group you'd be. You know, I, I'd meet with my friend's parents and I'd want to say after them, look, if every time your parents come to visit, I was in a monastery at the time, I have to go out and listen to your father do Italian jokes and go on, you know, on about this. It, this must be something in the way that they sort of view the world. So, on the other hand, when we ask the West, what do you admire about Islam and Muslims? 57%, that is, ask Americans. 57% of Americans say, nothing or I don't know. When you ask Americans about their prejudice towards other religions, okay, 72% will say, roughly 72%, I think I remember the statistic, will say, they're not prejudiced towards Jews. Okay. 34% of Americans will say they're not pre prejudiced towards Muslims. And there are other statistics. Almost 50% of Americans say they don't believe Muslims could be loyal citizens. Okay. So you have a bit of a disjuncture there. Let's take the question of democracy or democratization. I prefer the phrase democratization because we don't necessarily use the word democracy. We talk about freedoms, we talk about rule of law rather than uh, emphasizing democracy because some people will argue democracy is a Western institution and a Western term, but we talk about the equivalent. Significant number of Muslims when asked uh, what, what they would put into a new constitution, say freedoms. When asked what they admire about the West, say the West freedoms, it's respect for human rights, it's transparency of government, uh, it's rule of law. Um, significant numbers of Muslims, bordering on majorities in a number of countries, uh, indicate that they want those freedoms, okay? Uh, from their government, as well as freedoms with regard to gender, that is, uh, freedom for women. Majorities of men and women in most Muslim countries, in concluding conservative Muslim countries like Saudi Arabia, say that women should have equal rights of citizenship, equal rights to education, equal rights in the job market, and equal rights to senior positions in government. Now, why that doesn't exist in some Muslim countries is an interesting question, and one needs to think about that. But if we have those attitudes, then why doesn't it exist? And then work that through. Does it have something to do with the political structure? Does it have to do something with the religious institutions or the religious structure, etc.? Okay. Um, and then um, the issue of violence or terrorism. When we look at the people we survey, we distinguish be between the mainstream, roughly 93%, and potential radicals. Now, What's the criterion for that judgment? It's whether or not you think 9-11 was justified. Okay? Some 93% of Muslims across the world think 9-11 was not justified. Okay? That doesn't mean that they all like American foreign policy, but they don't believe 9-11 was justified. You know, they, they see it as a, a terrorist act. 7% believe 9-11 was justified. However, potential extremists, potential radicals, are not people who engage in violence. They are exactly what we call them, potential. What does that mean? Let's compare them to the mainstream. They're no more religious than the mainstream, so religion's not the primary driver. They're better educated, more internationally aware, more optimistic about their own lives, but more pessimistic about the future of their country, their region, and the Muslim world vis-a-vis -vis the West. They're much more concerned about intervention, domination, Invasion. Surprisingly, potential radicals believe more than the mainstream that democracy is the way forward and that relations with the West are important, but they're far more cynical that that will ever happen. They more than the mainstream, not that the mainstream don't believe this, but it's not as much a priority, they more than the mainstream believe that the West has a double standard when it comes to the promotion of democracy and that it will never allow uh, a democratic form of government that it does not approve of, uh, that it does not find acceptable. One can think, for example, of early American policy with regard to Iraq and the way in which the government was to be structured. One can think of the response to the election of Hamas, etc., and see how that reflects. Okay. And majorities in most, not all, countries uh, 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 dovetail this with the whole question of the invasion of Iraq which they see as counterproductive, uh, as uh, illegitimate, uh, and so it dovetails with that vision we talked about. Now a final point. How does each side view the other with regard to the future? Both sides believe the other side doesn't really care about better relations, when in fact both sides indicate that they do care. Okay? But 
What do they agree on and where do they differ? They both agree that we need to know each other better. We need to have more exchange programs, we need to have better educational programs, educate the next generation, etc. As you might think. Better communication. Okay. But that's where Americans and in general Europeans stop. In other words, they don't see anything else. It's almost like we say, the problem is you don't understand us. So what we really need to do is to engage more and do all of this. Okay? For many in the Muslim world, they include foreign policy. For many in the West, they don't really see it as a necessary item. And so in the Muslim world, they're concerned about foreign policy. And policies like providing technological help, economic uh, development help, more respect for Islam and Muslims, Palestine, etc. Okay? So that's where there's a significant disjuncture. And so where does that bring us to? Well, it bring us, brings us to my concluding comment, which is that one of the points that I've been able to say that I agree with the Bush administration on, I got two minutes, uh, which is that the Bush administration talked about the military, economic approach, and public diplomacy. Where the Bush administration has failed, and the Bush administration has admitted this at times, is that its public diplomacy has been a failure. And the primary reason is our public diplomacy has tended to focus solely on public relations. We have been weakest when it comes to functioning on foreign policy, particularly a critique of our foreign policy and, th and thinking of the way forward. And there's a new study actually done out of, a, uh, out of the Saban Center, which I and others have signed off on, which talks about a new approach, which talks about emphasizing diplomacy, realizing the clash isn't about culture, but it's about foreign policy, and emphasizing economic development, development for jobs, etc. And I think that's the direction in which we need to move, and hopefully that's the direction that a new administration will move in. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are some, uh, some interesting differences which you get into, into in the book. What do you see with the change here? Well, what it's kind of impact would it have? Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, the book has been very well accepted, uh, but it's been far more covered, at least initially, yeah. far more covered in uh, foreign press. Uh -huh. Almost immediately after the book came out, Le Monde, leading German newspapers, newspapers in China, Azerbaijan, all had you know coverage, articles, etc. Um, in America, you don't get the same coverage. A lot of radio programs, a lot of you know, a certain amount of TV, but not, not the big interview programs. We did Charlie Rose, but, but Charlie Rose himself was amazed that we did not do a lot of the major talk shows that you would think. Even reviews in major media, Christian Science Monitor, but not Washington Post, not New York Times. Although the Washington Post assigned it to someone, they then took the book back and said, why don't you review this other book? We're going to get somebody else to review this book. Yeah. Review never appeared. And, uh, I don't know. One, one doesn't have to be uh, paranoid to say you have to wonder why. I think one of the reasons is that there are people who really have a problem with some of the findings here because the findings do go against the conventional wisdom <coughs> and they do provide very hard, if you accept the evidence, they provide very hard evidence for the failures of a lot of policies and for the kinds of changes that have to occur that I think some people don't want to see occur. Uh, on the other hand, I do have to say that there's been a lot of interest from uh, various sectors of the government and the military. Uh, Dalia Magahid, my co-author, and I have done a lot of programs for government officials as well as non-government officials. Um, and I've done them here, I've done them in Europe and other places. Uh, but, but still I think that there has to be uh, more kind of aggressive uh, visibility. You know, yeah, we do talks right. to all kinds of international groups across the United States, but I still think that, you know, if we had come out with a different set of findings, <laughs> there would have been a lot more coverage. I mean, your major media would jump to it. You know, if you said, we can verify that large numbers of, 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 of Muslims are, think that there should be a third world war. You know, uh, you know what I mean, and and that it's impending, or you know, large numbers of Muslims think X. You know, uh. right. good. So we will have now questions from the audience. Yeah. Did you find a lot of national or regional variation from Indonesia to Pakistan to Egypt to Morocco, and if so, have you been able to 
uh, analyze uh, the pat any patterns that that may have uh, arisen. From well, there that? are there are some uh, some interesting differences which we get into into in the book, and um, a few that I remember. Uh, um, I was saying to somebody, I testified in a case uh, yesterday in Dallas, and uh, the guy who was cross-examining me was referring to a meeting that I said I had in Jordan 10 or 15 years ago, and he kept saying, kind of like, uh, so exactly who set up the meeting and what happened at the meeting? I said, that was 15 years ago. I do a lot of meetings. <laughs> finally, he, uh, we did this five times, and finally he said, what street was it on? <laughs> this is after I thought I had established the whole thing, so I said, I don't remember. But some of the patterns are, for example, on some questions, Turkey stands out from Arab countries, uh, for example, on the question of Sharia. One of the things we do see with regard to democracy and women's rights, which I forgot to mention, is that majorities in most countries uh, want to see Sharia as a source of law. And, and they mean different things, but for some it's religious principles and values. Both women and those that want democracy, and clearly people are saying, we want democratization, but we don't necessarily want Western secularism. Okay, uh, And there are also differences at times uh, in attitudes between, let's say, uh, uh, Indonesia and, uh, and uh, some parts of the Arab world and some parts of uh, the, uh, the Middle East. And clearly there are differences. While you could say that there's a broad-based concern, I mean, this we know, while there may be a broad-based concern, let's say, about Palestine, the stronger opinions are going to occur in the Arab world uh, than they are, uh, you know, outside of, uh, outside of the region. But on most of your major issues, like, uh, you know, broader democratization, um, you know, women's uh, issues, uh, concern about violence. I mean, uh, Muslims even more than Americans, and both are very concerned about what they see as fanaticism, extremism, um, and, and terrorism. Uh, but of course, you know, it's no wonder most of the victims still of terrorism uh, and most of the battlegrounds are in the Muslim world, which a lot of people forget. Yes, good afternoon. The Obama uh, public relations uh, camp has uh, worked hard to verify that uh, Barack Obama is not a Muslim. However, I think that there must be some coincidence to his name at this time. And do you think that that is in some cryptic way a, a signal of uh, an opening in America's relationships with Muslims? There's no doubt about the fact that in the Muslim world, certainly in Indonesia, because he studied there in many parts of the Muslim world, people are looking for uh, Obama uh, to, uh, uh, to come in because they see him as an internationalist and certainly in the Muslim world people will feel okay <coughs> excuse me uh, he's not a Muslim but clearly he has and I hate to word it this way because Daniel Pipes would love this uh, he has Muslim roots in some way you know his father was a Kenyan Muslim uh, his stepfather in Indonesia uh, he's lived in Muslim societies um, so I, there's no doubt that there'll be an opportunity. My own, my own prediction is unless there's a miracle, there will be uh, m uh, more of a receptiveness and a, and a reaching out, but on the Palestinian-Israeli, I wouldn't expect uh, a anything very significant. Uh, it would take uh, uh, an incredibly, no president has been w uh, willing to bite the bullet on that. And it would take, when I look at his advisors, most of his advisors, I don't see any reason to hope for significant change on that, on that issue. A lot of people here talk of the principles on which America was built, the Judeo-Christian principle. Within our lifetime and uh, having heard you, do you think it's a long way off before we hear the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition? Well, uh, to paraphrase the first President Bush, read my books. Um, actually, uh, I and a number of other people, I'm always out selling. What can I tell you? You know, uh, you know we've got to meet bills. I mean, this is reality. Um, that's right. The struggle. I mean, I wear all Italian clothes. You can just imagine what that takes. And in honor of you, I made sure. Shoes, everything's Italian except the shirt. Shirt's Singapore, but everything else is. Um, I'm so effective at this, I had a guy come out of the audience. I mentioned some of my audiences, I will admire a tie, and the person will come out and give me their tie. So I gave a talk recently, the guy came out and said, you didn't say that, but you wore this jacket, this tie doesn't go as well, let me give you my tie, and he pulled it off and gave it to me. So if any of you have a diamond ring, a tie, etc., <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to collect it. But the fact is that there is, there is more of a movement this way in recent years. There are those who talk about a Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, literally that way. And certainly presidents have learned to talk about Muslims and mosque when they now talk about church, synagogue. And we're going to see that more and more. Now clearly for some people that's threatening. 
You know what I mean? For, for your sort of uh, anti-Muslim, you know, the, be, you know, the uh, people who, in one way or another, you know, p for political reasons, they're anti-Muslim, for cultural, you know, I would say, f again, for the Martin Kramers of the world, the Daniel Pipes of the world, etc., they don't want to go there. I mean, they just don't want to go there. They will say Judeo-Christian versus Islam without pointing out there are distinctive differences, if you say Judeo-Christian, between Judaism and Christianity. But on the basis of similarities, we say Judeo-Christian. So why not Judeo-Christian-Islamic? Which is why I began to study Islam, when I suddenly realized that there was this third tradition, you know, that had that anchor. So I think we will see that uh, clearly more and more. Yeah. One sidebar I wanted to say today is also Condoleezza Rice's birthday, okay, which I find rather interesting. Oh, I, you I thought you were going to ask us to sing happy birthday. But not at all. <laughs> we could not sing bye bye Condi, but you know. No, that, might, that might be it. And today's my mom's birthday. So, but anyway, I, what I wanted to ask in terms of the book, because I haven't mm -hmm. read it yet, is to um, ask <coughs> what focus, if it's who speaks um, for Islam, on African Americans who represent the largest community of Muslims in the United States and then also the African diaspora. Um, what did uh, you get in terms of the statistics and mm. who speaks for Islam mm. from them? Okay, one, I, I should have mentioned that, that, that this, is, uh, this book is rooted in the Gallup World Poll, mm -hmm. which uh, basically was, it, it, it polls 90% of the world's countries. And then out of that, uh, the, they created a, a Muslim uh, sort of uh, institute within Gallup, and that took the 35 countries out, okay, now, in the Muslim world. Now we have expanded the number of countries, gone back into the countries. This poll will go on every year for 100 years, okay? Every year for 100 years. And mark my words, okay, I've never taken on a project that I don't see to the end. So, <laughs> I thought about it. And I decided I'd run an extra mile, drink an extra martini, with all due respect, um, and, uh, and I'm going to make, make it to the end. But what we are doing now is, uh, as, in Jan uh, as of January, there will be a major poll done uh, of American Muslims. And we've already now done uh, three, and the data's coming in, uh, just parenthetically, uh, Britain, Germany, and France in some depth, whereas before we just did like major cities. So it's going to occur much more in the data that will be get, uh, gathered from January on so that we will have much more, because uh, we recognize the need to include what's going on in America, what's going on in terms of the, excuse me, the African-American community. Of course, in the Gallup World Poll itself, we do cover a number of African countries like Senegal um, and others. Well, for that answer, you can read my new book, The Future of Islam, which inshallah will be finished, uh, if it kills me, by Christmas time. My attention that you talked about uh, the the answers to human to the questions related to women rights in, in Muslim countries. Uh, do you control for gender there? Uh, because it's it's quite you know expected that at least fifty percent of the population would be in favor of more women rights. Yeah. Well, you, so you know, it's it's not that it's only women that are in favor of more women. Oh rights. no no I I mean say uh, no. Uh, Majorities of women and men. Okay. Yeah, majorities of women and men believe that women should have all those rights. That's what makes it remarkable. I mean, that women would want those rights, you know, but that you've got signi you know, significant numbers of males. Yeah, majorities uh, uh, believe, and, and what they're really expressing when they also say they believe that it can be rooted with their religious values, which of course completely contradicts the images of, for example, westernized Iraqi women who may get interviewed, elites and say, you know, this is a disaster, they do also refer to religious values. So it also implies uh, that, uh, that these are people who interpret their religious tradition not in the way that some Muslims have interpreted it to uh, restrict and oppress women's rights. Yeah, no, 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 it's, it's and, and in fact, even in the interviews, what I'll t uh, the other thing I should tell you is that um, 
uh, if, for example, uh, a woman seems, uh, there's, there's a tendency to make sure that you have a woman interviewing a woman. If a woman seems uncomfortable because a man's interviewing her, they make sure it's a woman. If, uh, if there's an interview, and one of the guys who did, who did an interview commented that uh, there was an interview where the, uh, the guy was interviewing the woman, but the husband kept interrupting to answer the questions. <laughs> and so he kept saying, no, I want her opinion. And then finally what they did is somebody said to the husband, why don't we go outside and have a talk? You know, somebody else who was there to get him out of the room. So that there's very much a, a, a consciousness, uh, you know, uh, to be sensitive to that issue. Yeah. Thank you. you mentioned that Turkey um, stands out uh, in a number of aspects of this of this uh, survey. Uh, what ways does it stand out? The issue of uh, of Sharia, uh, of Sharia as a source of law. Uh, uh, Turkey uh, uh, is not in the same place that. Uh, majorities in other parts of the, uh, the Muslim world are. And clearly I would attribute that to the history and to the constitution of Turkey so that, you know, whether people are um, uh, old style, uh, you know, government or, or AK party in general, um, there's going to be much more of that um, sense of separation. Um, th that's a kind of sort of, uh, you know, uh, major area. And there are two others, but I just don't remember right now. Did you ask, or will you ask at some point, who speaks for Islam inside Islam, in the sense of clerical authority, divisions within the religion itself? Yeah, I, I address that issue quite extensively, <coughs> and Muslim responses. Uh, you know, looking at the whole question, both of uh, ulama, the new el ulama, the televangelist, uh, the non-ulama, and their attitudes with regard to who should speak for Islam. Um, uh, but. Um, I'd have to see whether or not there's a way for us to also couch the question, you know, uh, within Muslim, clearly within Muslim societies, there is, there is still, I mean, a respect for ulama, for a minority of Muslims. A minority of Muslims want to see the Sharia as the source of law. For those people, they want to see clergy directly involved. But a majority of Muslims, in contrast to a majority of Americans, do not want to see religious leaders involved. A majority of Americans more than 50% of Americans believe that American legislation should be based on the Bible. And almost 44% of Americans believe that religious clergy should be involved in that process. Those positions are not held among majorities in the Muslim world, which is an interesting kind of uh, contrast. I was curious to know, what is it going to take um, for, I guess, negative misconceptions and um, negative opinions of Muslims to be deterred. What, whose job is that and um, what is it going yeah. to take? Uh, I think it's going to take an act of God uh, to, uh, <laughs> in the short term. I think it's going to be long term. I think the fallout from 9-11, you know, the fallout from Iran was, uh, uh, it had been 20 years. And even now, uh, you know, if you, if you just, you know, scratch somebody hard, you can have a flare up. If you look at Lebanon, if you followed Lebanon, I lived in Lebanon in the early 70s. You look post-Civil War, et cetera, in Lebanon, et cetera. You know, things look like they're going along, and then, well, the fallout from 9-11 is there. I mean, you can see it. If you, if you look, still look at a lot of our legislation and the way it's uh, undertaken, uh, if you look at uh, uh, some of the trials, I mean, many, you know, I I've seen trials, and the trial that I've, I've just come back from, you know, my take on that trial was that, uh, you know, the way in which this was situated and is being situated by the Justice Department is playing to the, the basis. It's not about, you know, uh, being open-ended and trying to find out whether somebody is innocent or guilty. It's literally trying to contextualize within a terrorist kind of contextualization any trial, you know, in terms of the kind of statements you put out there. I was thinking today, you know how we quote out of, we, we, we quote the Quran, a text of the Quran, as if, okay, and then we quote a commentator from years ago. This is what people believe, okay? If you read Mamdani's book, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim, he has a great quote in which he talks about quotes from popes at a certain point in history, particularly Bernard of Clairvaux. Bernard of Clairvaux is somebody that I grew up and I still admire enormously. He established, I remember correctly, the Benedictines. Uh, Cluny was an incredible monastery, great father of the church, but he reflected the times. And in those times in which you had the Crusades and the conflict, it got to a point where in the Crusades it wasn't just about killing the enemy, it was exterminate all of them. That's what they were talking about. In fact, they say it's not homicide, we're talking about malicide. You see, because it's evil. And, and what, what do Osama and at times the Bush administration, in their fight, do. They talk about the other side as evil. Once you say evil, 
then you're into, okay, well, when you've got this context post 9-11, getting beyond all of that information that's out there and the constant information and the way in which it bombards people who don't know and the things that they see, it's going to take a long time. It's going to take a long time. I, I was a keynote speaker at a Homeland Security conference, and I got up at the end of my talk, in which I was keynoting about the, the potential threat of Muslim extremists to America, etc. And I read a threat that I had received at 3 a.m. in the morning, and then I finished it and said, when they heard the threat, this is not from a Muslim, you know. And it was an incredible sort of threat, you know. They never say they're going to do it because then you could put the, it's people should come to your office and grab you and you know grab you by your hair, you know, take you out, bitch slap you until your body's bloodied, and even that wouldn't be good enough. You know, I mean, those kinds of... Well, you know, you've got a lot of stuff out. You want to see how bad things are? You don't even just have to look at all the commentators. Just look at the way they've handled Obama's candidacy. The way, quote, those who, who are anti-Muslim have chosen to get into things like, well, he may not think he's a Muslim, but wasn't he born of a Muslim father? And whether he likes it or not, that's, doesn't that make him a Muslim? And, and the New York Times ran an editorial from a, a terrorism expert that said, and, you know, it would be nice to elect him, but then we'd have a, he'd have a major security problem as president because Muslim presidents couldn't trust their security guards not to assassinate him. I think there are just too many people who sort of feel safe or who don't want to stand out. Do you know what I mean? And who rightly worry at times. If I give money to an organization, will it come back to haunt me? You know? That's why, if you are that kind of person who's worried, I respect your right. I'm not going to tell you what to do. But if you want to be safe, give money to my organization. Okay. Uh, but your question, basically, your question, what John has been telling us in this book and 12, is empowering Muslims. That's right. They are the ones who have to define, who have to tell us what they want. So therefore, the more articulate they are, the more assertive they are, the more qualified they are, then they will be able to and Muslims are getting there. I mean, many of, uh, of the, not only the older, but the younger generation are a great hope, you know, uh, if they don't drop out. I mean, that is, you know, they go to the good schools, you get good jobs, you try to make it into the right, you know, the right professions and law and medicine, etc. But also into the media, as difficult as it is, his daughter is with the media, you know. Unfortunately, she writes for the Inquirer and a lot of those. No, I'm only, I'm only kidding. Uh, but, uh, you know, getting Muslims into the media, into the State Department, into the, you know, into the Justice Department, it may, it may take a while, but th those are the kinds of pressures. And hopefully with an Obama uh, presidency, there will be that pressure. And if it's not met short term, that it will be long term. Hopefully people will take Obama to task if there isn't sufficient representation. But this is what, you know, I think the Muslim community has to do. And it's, it's got that ability. I got lost in your presentation about democratization. I wasn't sure if you were talking about uh, the states here, what's taking place or what should be taking place here in America, Muslim or world. if you were talking about the Arab world. The Arab and Muslim world. The well, Arab yeah. and Muslim world. Right. But of course in the Arab and Muslim world there is also uh, not too much uh, Jewish presence there, but there is a, a great uh, Christian Mm. presence there mm. and somehow uh, other than Turkey as far as mm. uh, you feel mm. and uh, I also feel being there and loving it um, is there any country that is a other than Baha'i or uh, mm. uh, what's that Dubai Dubai, Dubai. Dubai yeah. uh, that is open to the rest of the world uh, equally is there any example in the Arab world where you feel democratization should be the symbol of the rest of the countries to adopt. Well, I think, I think that, you know, the, the issue you have, we get into it in the book, the issue you have is that historically, I do this very briefly, uh, uh, it, you know, much of the Arab and Muslim world went through a century, two centuries of European colonialism. Uh, whatever, the, whatever the colonizers wanted to do, developing a strong civil society and promoting democracy was not one of them. Unfortunately, when, when Muslim countries and Arab countries, most of them got uh, their freedom, what did they get? They got kings military and ex-military. So many of the governments are authoritarian and continue to be authoritarian. So, and the elites, that is the, the entrenched elites, support that kind of structure because it's to their benefit. The result is you have st a structure that has, tends to prevent democratization and in fact becomes inventive. In Syria, it goes from father to son. Uh, there are still rumors that in Egypt and Libya that may happen. 
The, the problem also is that Western countries, even when they say they're going to pressure for democracy like the U.S., ultimately back down because many of these authoritarian regimes after 9-11 say, hey, you've seen what terrorists are like and any opposition I have is terrorist. Whether it's mainstream, they don't use this phrase, whether it's mainstream or extremist, they just have, like in Egypt, they have cracked down completely. On the other hand, in terms of uh, religious pluralism, which I think is an issue, there are serious problems with regard to religious pluralism. In terms of moving from traditional Muslim teachings to, let's say, a modern state, equality of citizenship, equality of rights. Uh, but we do see some movement. We certainly see, not enough, and we see also a pullback. We, we do see, for example, in the Gulf, uh, more governments opening up to building Christian churches, etc. I think it's important to get a historical perspective on this. Uh, in Christendom, okay, uh, you did not have anywhere, you, you had similar problems, okay, well into the 20th century. Franco and Salazar, Spain and Portugal, okay, Catholic. At the same time, the Catholics today forget their history, including the Pope. They develop amnesia. In the 20th century, Franco and Salazar, it was perfectly acceptable for them to discriminate against other religions, against Protestants, etc. They allowed them to exist, but they controlled very much their existence, their ability to build churches. And in many ways, they reflected some of the attitudes that you see in the Arab and Muslim world. You do see now uh, uh, Muslim thinkers and religious leaders, not all, but you know, a number in terms of a process of reform, more and more uh, reinterpreting the tradition to argue for a notion in which, yes, you talk about people of the book, Jews and Christians and others, but what that translates into is equality of citizenship, equality of rights, you know, of all rights, and equality of access. But that's going to take a time uh, to be, uh, uh, sound like, I sound like an Italian, don't, that's going to take a time. Uh, that's going to take time for it to be accepted. Think about this, Roman Catholicism did not accept religious pluralism, did not accept religious pluralism until Vatican II. That's the end of the 60s, early 70s, and it's still struggling with it. You know, it's still struggling with it. There's a real, from my point of view, real uh, um, ambivalence uh, in the Vatican today uh, as compared to what, what I think what Vatican II says. And on the one hand, it says it's, it's open to religious pluralism, it recognizes other religions. On the other hand, it tends to fall back in a rather conservative position, uh, you know, uh, at, critical, at critical points. And I think that that's what we're going to need to see. I think part of the problem you have with change in the Muslim world is you've got authoritarian rulers who only like to liberalize so much. You know, they really aren't going to liberalize on free press. They're not going to liberalize the educational system. They're not going to liberalize when it comes to political parties. You know? I mean, in fact, what you see now is a number of author more, th more authoritarian governments, many of them I visit, so I have to be, but, you know, Egypt, uh, Jordan at times, and others, who use the language of democratization to, in fact, get more control. So they talk about, for example, uh, civil society. And so we're going to build our NGOs. But if government is building NGOs, then you have government control, non-government organizations. You know, in, in Jordan, they call them royal NGOs. You know? And you have in Egypt, in order to make sure that NGOs uh, don't capture elections, then the government sets up regulations. And if they don't like the results of the elections, they redo, you know. So we've got a challenge there. And this is where part of the challenge is to the U.S. I think the U.S. has to emphasize diplomacy rather than military. Military is last resort. But more importantly, the diplomacy needs to be dovetailed with economic, job, and educational development. Okay? And using that as a lever. It's got to be diplomacy and quiet pressure. But we have a perfect right if we give a lot of aid or protection to indicate to countries where we have problems. I mean, I think that that is perfectly understandable. But it's going to take a new mentality, you know. If we're still debating whether or not we can talk to the Muslim Brotherhood, and if we still have people saying the Muslim Brotherhood is some sort of terrorist organization that we should be concerned about, we're not going to go anyplace. I mean, we're, you know, uh, you know, in terms of our ability to deal with representative groups. I mean, w whether one likes it or not, you know, these are groups that are representative. And so we have to speak not only to the people in power who are authoritarian, but to other sectors in order for us to, to have a certain kind of legitimacy and in order to be able to bring about reform, you know. Um, I think that's, that's still going to be a challenge for uh, any administration. Yeah.